again, I just want to thank everyone for just uh, allowing us to be at the In Faith Pastor Conference. It was just a joy to be there. And speaking of In Faith, I guess we have one missionary letter here that we have from Steve and Barb Bolsey from In Faith, and they are missionaries in Idaho, if I'm not mistaken. So, but we have a, a Christmas letter here, and I can probably put it over here on the table. And I just wanted to share that with folks if they wanted to read that missionary letter. So it's good to hear from our missionaries. And I should probably be reading more of our missionary letters. And so I'll be doing that. So, But the last time we were here, we were in, we were in the book of Hebrews, and we talked about our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that he is our eternal heavenly high priest, and that he is the real thing. He's the real McCoy. He's not a model, and he doesn't dwell in an earthly model tent. He is in the real heavenly of heavenlies in heaven, that most sacred place at the throne of God the Father. And he is, we learned also that time, that he is 100% human and that he is 100% divine. And that he is perfect, and yet he is sympathetic with us. And we're going to probably do a little deeper dive into that subject today. But also, we covered that we can draw near as opposed to shrinking back like the people did at Mount Sinai when the law was presented to them, we are encouraged to actually draw near to God and to come close to him because we are his children. And today, like I said, we'll take a deeper dive into the sympathy of the high priest of, of Jesus Christ. And the original in, um, audience that the author of Hebrews was writing to is they were probably saying, okay, we have Jesus as our high priest, but how can someone who is God in heaven be sympathetic with us? How can they actually plead our case? Because we know that prophets is God's prosecuting advocates on God's behalf. Prophets in the Old Testament, in an easy way to understand, they would be God's um, representative to man, his attorneys, his prosecuting attorneys saying, do this or this will happen, be prophesying and speaking on behalf of God. Priests are the opposite. They are man's advocate. They are man's <coughs> pleading on behalf of man to God, making sacrifices on behalf of man to God. And so the, the, the correct question, the logical question would be, how can God, how can Christ in heaven be an advocate for us? And we covered part of that last week. He became man. He is 100% man and 100% God. But how can Jesus effectively, empathetically, and sympathetically represent me or you to our Heavenly Father? And another way we can answer, ask this question as the title of our message today is, is, does God know what we go through in our daily life? And how has he done that? And again, you know, how can he be qualified to be my priest if he hasn't gone through what I have gone through here? So we're going to look at these qualifications here in today's passage from Hebrews chapter 4. But before we read God's word, let's pray and ask him to be with us. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we read your word, we pray that you would open our hearts and open our minds, that we would have your eyes to see what we need to see in your word today. And we thank you so much for your word. 
that you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. We pray these things in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Well, as you can see, the handout that we have today, it looks a little more colorful than just the black and white print. Well, the reason why is, is the points come from different parts. And so the first point where it says he is qualified because he is appointed comes from um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, and then verse 5 of chapter 5, and then verse 6 of chapter 5, and then verse 10. And then the parts that are in gray are from verses 3, and verses 4, and verses 9. He is qualified because he is perfect, not forgiven. And then he is qualified to sympathize, covers a larger portion, uh, verses 15 and 16 from chapter 4, and then verses 1 and 2, and then verses 7 and 8. So let's read the passage here that we have before, starting at verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts, and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins. As for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears, to the one who is able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Thanks be to God for his wonderful word. But like I said, does God know what we go through? How is he qualified to be a sympathetic high priest? And the first one that we are looking at today is he is qualified because he is appointed. We, we learn that in, verse, in chapter 4, 5 verse 1 it says every high priest taken from among men is appointed in other words the high priest wasn't something that they put in an application for and they went and they candidated for or anything like that he didn't sit down for an interview and no one sat there and said now what would make you a good high priest that was they didn't take place they didn't have to like say, well, I feel I'm qualified for this because they were appointed, they were picked, and maybe some of them were going, I don't know if I can do this. You're picked. This is your job. This is what you're doing. This also happened with the tribe of Levi. They were picked. And they were picked to be the priesthood. And this is what, and even from within the Levitical tribe, they narrowed it down to others that would be specifically picked. 
And they were the only tribe that wasn't given a portion of land in the land of Israel because of the promise that they would be scattered. And they were scattered throughout Israel because of this um, the job of being their priest. They had to be where the people were besides just in Jerusalem. And so we understand that he is that Jesus is qualified because he was appointed. And verse 14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, in other words, he's in the real heavenly of heavenlies, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. We know who was appointed. We know who was picked. And that was Jesus, the Son of God. And then in verse 5, he says, So also Christ did not glorify himself. In other words, he didn't pick himself. He says, So as to become a high priest. Well, who picked him? The passage says right here, He who had said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, you are priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. But the author is telling us here, he says, the one who I declared my son, I also declared to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. In other words, just as sure as Jesus is my son, he is the high priest. So that is what he's saying here. He says, the one who said you are my son is also the same person that said you are a priest. Does that kind of shorten it up and help us understand what he's saying there? So the, the assurance that we have an appointed high priest is the same assurance that we have that Jesus is the Son of God Almighty. That's a powerful thing to understand. He has been appointed by God the Father. He is Son. He is also our High Priest. That same assurance that He is the Son, He is our High Priest. And then, in the last verse that is mentioned here, it says, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. One of the things we have to understand is this is a comparison that the author is making between the Aaronic or the Levitical priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood. The Aaronic is a temporary one. But when Jesus was appointed to this position, as high priest, he was going to be the last priest in the Melchizedek priesthood. We could, in a lot of ways, say this is the Christ priesthood. And the reason why he's the last high priest is because he's eternal. And that is the one thing we, it's, it, it's not like he's the last one and when he dies, it's the end of it. We know he's never going to die. He is the last priest of the Melchizedek in order. He is the last one. And that is what he is saying here. He did not appoint himself. That was an act of humility. And he had also that perfection. And that's a rare quality when you find someone who is perfect, but yet humble at the same time. How do you know people who think of themselves as almost perfect and that they think of themselves as humble? You don't really find that too much. Usually people that think of themselves as, well, perfect, they're not too humble, are they? So, Jesus, who is perfect, yet he was humble. He didn't appoint himself to this position. The second message is, he is qualified, and this is the passages that are in gray. He is qualified because he is perfect, but not forgiven. He says, in verse 3, the author of the Hebrews is talking about the earthly priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood. He says, and because he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his sins, as for the people, so also for himself. Now I'm going to borrow from our third point. It says, 
He says, he can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself is beset with, with weakness. And I'm sure that the audience that the author is writing to, they're saying, well, how can he understand us if he, has, if he doesn't have weaknesses? If he's perfect, how can he understand us? And, and, but then he says, and no one takes the honor to himself but receives it when he is called by God, even as Aaron was. But then we also see um, that he says, And being made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. I want us to think a little bit right here. Jesus, he didn't die for his own sins, right? He didn't die for his own sins. He lived a perfect life when he was here on earth. He was tempted. We learn about that in Matthew chapter 4. That's the great passage that we read about where Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and was tempted by the devil. And he was tempted in all ways as we are. And We'll be getting deeper into that, but he's, uh, Satan asked him, if you are the son, command these stones to become bread. And then he also s took him to a very high mountain, showed him the, the, king, the world and all of their glory. He says, and all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And then he also said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. And he took him to the pinnacle of the temple. He says, throw yourself down because... The Bible say that says, He will command his angels concerning you on their hands, they will bear you up. If you throw yourself down, you're not going to die. You know you're going to have someone to catch you. And so these were the temptations that were put forth that Jesus uh, was tempted in all ways as we are. In the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life. These are the areas that he was tempted in. And he was tempted greatly, and we're going to be talking about that in, in a little further context. But he was perfect. He didn't need to have sacrifice for his sins. Um, but what did happen? He became that perfect sacrifice. Because what had to be offered, we learned from the Old Testament, it was a lamb without blemish. And he was that perfect sacrifice sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice for you and for me. But one of the things that I think really stands out to me as why he is qualified is he is able to sympathize because he can sympathize. He's gone through the temptation. He's gone through struggles as we are. He, he cried in this life. He experienced human emotion like you and I. When his friend Lazarus passed away, um, and we read in John chapter 11, 35, that Jesus wept. I like how one <coughs> translation stated it. He burst into tears. And then also, when he was standing and looking at Jerusalem, and he looked at Jerusalem, and it says that he wailed. He says, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. They were going to reject him. And so he said the, the word there where he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he was said, he, in the, it says in the original languages that he wailed like this. This was his wailing that he did. And then when he was on the cross, and we have two different passages from Matthew 27 and Mark 15 where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we also remember when he was in the garden and when he was praying. And in Matthew 26, 39 and in Luke chapter 22 where he begged the Father, he says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And the things that we read in this passage, he says, 
For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, one who has been tempted in, in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to, he to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided since he himself is beset with weakness. Jesus wasn't beset with weakness, but he did have struggles and trials. He, like I said, he had real emotion and real problems in this life. Like I said, when his friend Lazarus died, when he was standing over Jerusalem, when he was in the garden, Luke chapter 22 says that when he was praying that he sweat great drops of blood. And then he also says here, the author says in this passage, in the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplication with loud crying and tears to the one who is able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety, or because of his reverence. When it says he was offered up both loud crying and tears, this is when he would sweat great drops of blood. One of the things that I, I see that as I was looking at this passage, he suffered greatly. If we think about, he was begging the Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew to be separated from his eternal Father, to have the Father forsake him, because he did say, my Father, why have you forsaken me? He knew what death was. He, at this point, was saying, if there's another way, if there is another way. And we can understand how Jesus was tempted when Satan, when he said, and when he was tempted, when he says, and the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. There was another way, but he did not choose that way. Can you imagine? People think, well, that was really wouldn't be a temptation for Jesus. It was a temptation for Jesus, and God's word says that right here. If it is possible, let this cup pass for me. If it is possible, if there's any other way. But what does the Bible tell us later on? He says, it says that. He who, who looked to the glory ahead despised the shame. He went through shame. The shame of being hung naked on a cross. One of the most despised way to die. But not just that, but to, to have an eternal being to, to die. An eternal God to suffer death for us. This was the real pain and agony to have the Father forsake him. This is where I truly believed where the suffering that he went through for us. When he was separated from the Father during that time. And he says, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. How often probably did he pray that when he was there? We do know that shortly after that verse in Matthew 26, 39, when he said, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, we know the weakness of humanity with our human high priests because they suffer weakness because we are in fallen flesh. Because Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we do know that as human priests, the temporary Levitical priests, they had, who were beset with weakness because they were in fallen human flesh. But Jesus, he looked to the glory that was ahead of that, 
endured the shame, endured for being forsaken by the Father, endured all what he went through at the cross in the death. To me, I don't know if we fully understand the separation, the hurt that took place. This hurt the Father as much as it hurt the Son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. For people to tell me that God the Father is not the epitome of love and that Jesus is the epitome of love and that the Father is just some mean ogre up there and <coughs> that Jesus is pleading the Father is so willing to accept the pleas and prayers of Jesus as he is there at the right hand of God the Father right now. He accepts those prayers he, so much because he loves us so much. The Father loves us so much. <coughs> that is probably one of the most powerful things that we can think about in this passage. He, Jesus is our high priest to the Father. But the Father so willingly accepts the pleas <coughs> and prayers of Jesus. It is such a beautiful thing for us to understand. God so loved the world that he gave us his Son. That, to me, is such a powerful thing for us to understand about the high priesthood of Jesus. So what? Does God know what we go through in this life? You know, I've heard the phrase, you don't know what I've been through. Jesus does. He was rejected by the disciples. He was rejected by family. They thought, at times, and the scripture tells us, they thought he was mad. He was rejected by the Father. And when he said, my Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? And we have two instances where Jesus said that. The pain and the anguish that the Father and the Son went through at the cross, when people tell me, that there is more than one way to the Father, that there is more than one way to heaven, it to me is a slap in the face of God and what he went through at the cross. It is such a magnificent event, the pain and suffering, for someone to say that, oh, there's another way. What, and, and bypass what he gave to us at the cross? There is only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but by me. Be assured, we are on the right path if we know that Jesus, what he has gone through, what he has suffered through, that he can sympathize with us, empathize with us effectively when we hear his word. He was appointed. He, he, this was... He didn't take this on his own accord. He didn't say, I want this job. He was perfect. He lived the perfect sinless life. He was the perfect sacrifice as well as the perfect high priest. And he is able to sympathize because we know the anguish and the temptation that he dealt with in this life. The temptation, one of the things that I forgot to mention earlier, I mean, if we had gone through 40 days without food, and someone said, well, just go ahead, a lot of people would say, I would understand. I would understand if you actually did eat that food. Because, hey, 40 days without food, why not? But for Jesus, he lived that perfect, sinless life for us. And that truly was a temptation for him. And a lot of people don't understand that he truly was tempted. Was he going to sin? No. But there was that temptation. Uh, the way I, a lot of people often say, well, how can he truly be tempted? And the way I often talk about this is an impregnable city can be attacked, right? A city that's indestructible can be attacked. Doesn't mean it's going to fall, but it can be attacked. 
Jesus, as perfect and being as divine as he was, can still be tempted, especially when he took on human form and the things that he suffered. To me, when I read these things, what he went through, a lot of these make a lot more sense. But he says, let this cup pass from me. He had that opportunity, and he chose not to do that. He succeeded in defeating sin, Satan, and death. And to me, that is one of the most beautiful things when we see this passage. He is now our eternal heavenly high priest who can sympathize with us. He, what he went through at the cross for you and me is a wonderful thing. He sympathizes with us. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our qualified high priest. We know that you were appointed by our Heavenly Father. We know that you are qualified because you lived that perfect, sinless life. You are the, the Lamb of, of God. And, Lord, and Jesus, we also know that you are qualified because you went through so much, so much pain, and so much anguish, not only with Lazarus dying and with people being uh, forsaking you, Lord, but when the Father forsook you, Lord, and when you were on the cross, we know the pain and the anguish that you went through. Lord, we thank you that you are our Savior that you have died on the cross and that you are our high priest. In these things we pray.